Well, good morning, Grace family. We are here to worship our King. The psalm this calls us together from Psalm 149 this morning. Um, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let's join together at this time with the words on the screen and our hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Oh, Father, we are so grateful that your powerful name is to be hailed, that you are a great king, the great king over all the gods that is this day not only alive and well, but on his throne. And so we come and we come in response to your great revelation that you are God and there is none like you that you are a king worthy of singing praises to. And we sing with gusto, not because we have great voices, but because you are worthy of all vocal qualities and because we give you praise. Lord, we thank you that you in this time are still our God and that you are at work in your world, that you are redeeming a people for your own possession um, and that it is good for us to be glad in you who are not only our maker, but in this time we remember that you are a risen Savior and you're in this time sustaining your church. You are um, the King in Zion and we rejoice this day that you are good to us. And so, Lord, even as we gather, we pray as you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen our call to repentance as we come together 
from Psalm 4. I'm reminded that the psalmist cries out, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. It is in the full confidence that our King hears us when we cry to him that we can come boldly in our prayer of confession together using the words printed before you. Let us pray. Gracious and most merciful Father, you have granted us all things necessary for life and godliness, yet we too often wallow in pity, lament things lost that will not last, and overlook our many sins. Our great God, we come to you to confess our many sins, to plead the merits of the precious blood of your dear Son and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. We long to see our lives transformed, our faith strengthened, and our desires purified by the work of your Holy Spirit. Grant us to walk by faith in the newness of life the Lord Jesus purchased for us by his full and completed work on the cross. Through the merit and satisfaction of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And in the good news of the gospel of Jesus, we hear the words also of Psalm 4 in our assurance of pardon. In peace... I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. In the good news of Jesus, we are forgiven who have confessed by faith. It is now that we come to God's word. A couple scripture readings this morning from Genesis 11, as well as Luke 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had made brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do now will be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. This is Jesus. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept, saying, or kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. 
Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our great God and Father, we marvel at your goodness and grace to us. We stand as those who were once numbered among your enemies, those who were transgressors by nature, and yet you have wrought a good work in us. And so we come now to that throne of grace in the confidence that we are the redeemed of the Lord. We are those who have been forgiven. Lord, we thank you for the goodness and grace and mercy that you have lavished upon us by the full and finished work of Christ Jesus. We continue to celebrate his victory over death, even as we long to see him come again. And yet, Lord, in between those comings, we recognize that we continue to experience the travails of a of a world groaning in anticipation of its Redeemer, a world that is racked and beleaguered by sin and sadness and sickness and death. Lord, we in these days particularly are mindful of our lives, of the shortness that they are that they are but a vapor that is blown away in the wind. Father, we lift up before you Jeannie Proffer and her daughter Gloria and her family as they mourn the loss of Don this week. Lord, we take great courage in knowing that you are the sovereign Lord over all that you have called to yourself that you are sovereign over every action of every human being. And Lord, we, we rest in that today, knowing that all that the Father, you, Father, have given to the Son, none shall he lose. Lord, may your peace and comfort be with that family. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement that you are continuing to show to Hank and Dorothy in his recovery, we pray, Father, that you would continue um, to mend and knit his body back together again. Uh, give him strength, give him courage, give him your peace during this time. Lord, for all of us who continue to have anxious hearts during these days of being cooped up and isolated, uh, Lord, we, we long for community. We long for gathering again. And we pray, Lord, that you, would, that you would say to our hearts by your presence this day and that you would remind us that you one day again, and we pray soon that we will gather together again to worship and adore you as the body of Christ. Lord, we pray for our government officials from the very top to the very local, that you would be with them, grant them wisdom, grant them the the tools that they need to guide us all through these uncertain days. Lord, I pray you would grant to each one of us a gracious spirit, not only with all of those trying to make decisions about things they've never thought or experienced before, but with one another. Lord, may uh, grace truly abound in our hearts these days. And Father, we we are mindful of your uh, continued work in history. This is part of a grand scheme that you are working out and you are working it all together for our good. Lord, we we pray you would allow us to fix our eyes on Jesus during these days, that you would 
give us a, a, an insatiable hunger for your word and for fellowship with you. Lord, may we be rooted and grounded in a firm foundation of the Lord Jesus. And we make our prayer in his great name. Amen. We come down to our passage this morning from Revelation 17. Hear now God's word to us this day. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because the pit was was because the beast was and is not and is to come this calls for a mind with wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated they are also seven kings five of whom have fallen one is the other has not yet come and when he does come he must remain only a little while as for the beast that was, that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one, one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, these words uh, are fantastic and Sometimes they appear unbelievable, and yet you have given them to us for life. And so we pray, Lord, you would grant us wisdom, that you would give us discernment as we come now to your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we resume our journey in Revelation. We come to the next set of events. We've, we've continued to see this, this series of events, most of them in series of sevens, and they continue to zero in on that great day of the Lord. We'll get there in just a few more chapters. 17 through 19 here describe the destruction of every enemy of God. The dragon or Satan, the beast of the sea as we saw the powers of this world, the beast of the earth who was false spirituality, 
the city of Babylon and those who bear the mark of the beast. I, I was thinking about this. I, we ought to be deeply grateful for God's providence that we find ourselves at this point in the book, at this season in our nation's history. And think about this. All of the gods of this age are being exposed, and they're being exposed in us. Health, security, comfort, convenience, freedom. It was for such a time as this that the book of Revelation was written. The world of John's day and the world of ours are not so different. And his message continues to hold out to us the same hope it did in the suffering church in the first century. So point number one, the great prostitute. The first mention of Babylon in the Bible is Genesis 7. We heard that read together just a moment ago. Men got together and said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The, the people wanted to build a tower that reached into the heavens, that reached to the gods. Out of sinful pride, man was looking for fame, independence, and glory. Truly a can-do attitude. Now, to a nomadic people, a city was a big deal. It represents the ultimate in human community and fellowship. And I think it's, it's the key to understanding Revelation and what it says about two cities, Babylon and, new, and the New Jerusalem. I mean, truly, the Bible is a tale of two cities. The, the sin of Babylon is the desire for self-sufficiency, fame, independence, glory. Look at what we've done, they say. Look at what we've built. Look at how we've joined all peoples to each other and to God. And God comes and brings judgment. He confuses their language and scatters them across the whole earth. Fast forward about 2,000 years. Babel is now Babylon. And what a city it is. We've all, if we remember our history in school, remember that one of the seven wonders of the ancient world were the hanging gardens of Babylon. All nations and tongues were joined together under Babylon. Of course, it was by conquest. And so Nebuchadnezzar goes to the roof of his palace one night. He looks out over all of his city and he says this in Daniel 4. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Can you hear the refrain of Babel? Th that attempt for self-sufficiency, the desire for fame, independence, and glory. And God strikes Nebuchadnezzar with what we would understand to be an ancient version of mad cow disease. The spirit of Babylon was alive and well for John in the Roman Empire. Look at mighty Rome. Look at what we've built by our own hands. I marvel to this day that some of the roads that the Romans built are still better shaped than some of our roads today. But they, they said, look at the security, at the comfort, prosperity, at happiness that comes from our wisdom and strength. That didn't work out very well for Rome either. And this, this spirit of Babylon lives today, too. It, it, it pulses in our cities, in the people all around us. Man still attempts to make a name for himself, to make his own way to God and heaven. The efforts are doomed, but modern man tries anyway and says to himself, today, we have the power, the intelligence, the money, the technology. We can make a perfect world. We have the power to create life. We can genetically engineer our children. We can develop cures for AIDS and cancer and the coronavirus. 
Eternal life is not a fantasy. Utopia is ours for the making. And God cannot let that go either. So a question for you. Are we part of Babylon or are we part of the New Jerusalem? To which city does our heart belong? To which city do we give our allegiance? We're now introduced here to this woman who represents Babylon, the human society, and five things about this woman who is against God, against Christ, against the gospel. First, she lures and seduces. She's beguiling. Uh, you, you've heard it said probably, appearances can be deceiving. We know the truth of this proverb. Uh, this is true of churches too. We saw this in some of the churches that we looked at at the beginning of Revelation. The church in Laodicea, it looks rich and prosperous and healthy, but she's wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The church in Thyatira had a prophetess named Jezebel in the church who urges the Christians there to worship idols and practice the sexual rituals of the trade guilds so that they could work, feed their families, and remain in business. Jezebel, she represents great evil and wickedness. Appearances can be deceiving. This woman holds a golden cup. It's clean, it's polished, it's impressive on the outside, but inside it's filled with abominable things. Sure, she's really good to look at too. Dressed in purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. But John identifies her as the great prostitute, the mother of prostitutes. The prostitute from whom all other prostitutes come. A picture of idolatry, of, of giving our hearts to something or someone other than God. So why, why is this so vivid and crass? I, I think John wants to break the evil spell cast by this woman. She looks inviting, appealing, alluring. But underneath all the cosmetics, the clothing, the accessories, she's ugly, she's hideous. Appearances can be deceiving. It, it's why her name is called Mystery. Too. Her influence is vast. It's, in fact, universal. The great prostitute sits on many waters, it says. The, uh, now, that's certainly true of this, the city of Babylon. It sat on the river Euphrates. It had canals flowing all throughout the city. But it's not geography that counts here. It's symbolism. We're, we're told in verse 15, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. You see, Babylon the great prostitute has sovereignty over the people of the earth. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery. They're seduced and led astray by her. And the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Three. She is in partnership with the beast. Notice verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. We met this beast back in Revelation 13. It represents the kingdoms of this world that are opposed to God. And these kingdoms use their power to enforce allegiance to something other than the one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar did that. He forced everyone to bow down before his golden statue. The trade guilds of John's time forced their members to worship idol gods in order to work and live. Roman Caesars claimed divinity and demanded all acknowledge them as Lord. And seated on this beast is the woman, Babylon, the great prostitute. 
the woman and the beast work together. The beast uses brute force, the, the woman allure and seduction. Number four, she seduces with economic prosperity. <laughs> Just an aside here. Do not ever wonder why prosperity preachers are so successful. They have a great master. This prostitute oozes with wealth. Look at her dress, purple and scarlet. Gold and precious stones and pearls add to this picture of extravagant wealth. And in her hand, she's holding a gold cup of the wealthy, not some clay pot of the poor. Her list of clients include kings who shared her luxuries, the merchants who gained their wealth from her. We'll see those next week. When God's judgment is executed on Babylon in chapter 18, we hear them cry, alas, alas, woe, woe. It's the cry at a funeral. It's wailing and lamentation. The people have lost economic prosperity, so they are wailing and mourning. Their comfort, their security lies in wealth and riches and prosperity rather than in God. <laughs> Is our current worldwide economic situation a taste of God's judgment upon Babylon? I think it is. It is just a taste, however. In the span of one month, the world has been brought to its knees economically. Tens of millions in the United States unemployed. Investment accounts plummeting. Do you hear the cries of woe? Have we been seduced by Babylon? The quickest way to tell is our response to the possibility of losing it all. Some cry, whoa, whoa. We have exploding rates of depression and suicide. We have people using schemes and scams to save their wealth or to make wealth from those who are hurting. Why? Because they think today's economic situation is the worst thing that could possibly happen. How about us? And then five about this woman. She hates Jesus, the gospel, and the church. Verse six says, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She tolerates no rivals. She wants all to bow before the altar of economic success. She wants all to be seduced into worshiping money rather than God. And if you refuse her, like the early Christians did, you're persecuted, mocked, shunned, maybe even killed. Number two, the destruction of the beast. Verse six says, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. John isn't implying here amazement or admiration. He's confused and fearful because he expects to see the woman suffering under judgment. Instead, he sees her seductive beauty leading the world astray. Fear grips him because rather than seeing a woman defeated, she is drunk on the blood of the martyrs. The angel now describes the destruction of the beast for us. Now, we're, we're to see that the woman and the beast are inseparable. The woman's riding on the beast. They work in tandem. Their relationship is mutually beneficial. The destruction of the beast has negative consequences for the great prostitute, as we'll see again next week. We'll have a taste of it a little bit today. Verse 8 says, The beast that you saw was and is not, and is to come. And when we hear that, we should immediately think of the description of God, God the Father, God the Son, 
who is described as him who is and was and who is to come. It, it, it expresses the eternality of God. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the fountain from which all else comes. That's our God. And so the beast tries to be like God, but he's really nothing but a cheap imitation. It's one of the tools that Satan uses. We've seen this before. He set up a counterfeit trinity of a dragon and two beasts. He even faked a resurrection. But the beast is not God. That's the message of the angel here. He was, now is not, and will come. So the beast was. There, there was a time when the beast was when he when the power of godless governments was used to persecute God's people. Think Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Rome. The beast now is not. We read that and we think, oh, he must be out of commission. But it, it can't mean that. I think what it means is, his activity is severe, severely curtailed, and it's curtailed because of what we have been celebrating, what we celebrate every Lord's Day, the cross and the grave. Satan thrown into the abyss so his powers are restrained. He is no longer able to deceive the nations as he did prior to the death and resurrection of Christ. Then... God's people were almost exclusively ethnic Jews. The nations were deceived. Now, they are from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. As we heard in Luke 11, the strong man has been bound, and he has been plundered, and he's been plundered by the Lord Jesus. And then he is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. I, I love this. I love this language. No great fanfare, no great deception, only judgment. You think about the coming of Jesus and, and the glory that is surrounding it. And here, he rises from the bottomless pit and is destroyed. The unbelieving world is astonished. Not, not the confusion and fear of John. <laughs> but admiration. And so the angel says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The spirit knows some of the wild leaps of imagination and exegesis this verse incites. <laughs> and there are, there are plenty of them. And so the angel calls us all to wisdom. The seven heads. He tells us that they are seven hills and seven kings. And commentary after commentary after commentary runs to identify these with seven Roman emperors because Rome is built on seven hills. But which emperors? Every commentary has a list of seven different ones. They can't agree. And the beast is both one of the seven kings Oh wait, there's an eighth king. Others propose that the seven kings who become eight kings are world kingdoms. But again, which kingdoms? The key, wisdom, to understand this lies in the number seven. We've seen this again and again and again. And when we see this, we ought not to think, oh, I've got to figure out what these seven are exactly. But what is, what, is, what is this seven speaking of? They're symbolic. It's apocalyptic literature. Numbers are symbolic all the way through Revelation. God doesn't intend us to take them literally. The seven heads. They represent the full power of earthly powers that have persecuted the church throughout all of human history. But what does verse 10 mean then? Five have fallen, one is, 
the other has not yet come. I think it's actually pretty simple. Again, we, we want to we wanna parse every comma and period and every word and try to understand. But I think this is what that means. We're closer to the end than the beginning. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Yes, the beast is still alive. Yes, persecution still happens. But the end is coming, and it is coming soon. And ten horns. The ten horns, uh, verse 12, the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. Again, not literally ten. I recall growing up in this world, the endless speculation that the European Union was the Ten Horns. There were ten nations, and it was, of course, God raising up this beast and the Ten Horns. Entire books have been written about this one verse. The problem is, <laughs> there are a lot more than ten countries in the European Union. It falls apart immediately. The ten horns are ten kings who make war against the lamb. But, but they're also more than ten kings. Like the seven heads, they represent the full number of earthly powers that have persecuted the church throughout human history. God is piling on metaphors here to help us to understand the forces of evil against us. You see, in this passage, we, we get lost again in the numbers, but there's only one number, one phrase, I think, that is most important here. It's not their number, it's their time. One hour. In the ancient world, one hour was the smallest measurement of time that they had. I mean, we, we measure time in minutes and seconds and nanoseconds even. But the ancient world measured time in hours. Yes, it seems long when you are the one facing persecution. I'm sure it felt like that for the churches and Christians of Asia Minor as they suffered under Rome. <laughs> but when measured against eternity, it is nothing. It's just a blink of an eye. One hour. Do you hear what John is saying? The seven hills are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. The ten horns, which are ten kings, receive authority for one hour. The end is coming. Their time is nearly up. Their destruction, which is also the beast's destruction, the prostitute's destruction, the dragon's destruction, it's almost here. So why is their time nearly up? Verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. It's almost as if God just interjects for just a moment and says, oh, by the way, with the breath of his mouth, they will be done. Who overcomes the seven kings, the ten kings, the kings of the earth, the beast, the prostitute, the dragon? The Lamb. Not the lamb with his mighty hosts, not the lamb with a great multitude, just the lamb. He is the lamb that we saw in Revelation 5 who was slain, who, was, who with his blood purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It is the lamb who has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, where he reigns now as King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lamb alone wins the victory. But I love this little addendum. Though the Lamb alone secures the victory, he is not alone. Notice, he brings with him those who are called and chosen and faithful. It includes you and me. If we are one of his followers, if we are a follower of the Lamb. 
again, this book is not so much about the enemy, it's about Jesus and his great victory. The coming victory, it, it, it's simply a completion of the victory he already won at the cross. That was the place of victory. His words, it is finished, meant it was done. That was the decisive battle. And so he conquers his enemies as the lamb who was slain. And then very quickly, point number three, the destruction of the prostitute. We, we come sort of come back to what the angel first promised John, the punishment of the great prostitute. Verse 16, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. There's a, another saying that is quite prominent. There is no honor among thieves. <laughs> a thief will steal from another thief. Well, there's no honor when it comes to the dragon, the beast, the woman, and the kings of the earth either. They turn on one another. Uh, too often, I think, we, we believe the wicked to be a cohesive, united, one big happy family. But we must never forget the self-destructive power of sin. We must never forget that sin always, always contains the seeds of its own destruction. The wicked give way to their wicked nature. It is what Paul says in Romans 1 when God pours out his wrath on humanity. And one of the ways he does that is by giving them over to their wickedness. This should, this should warn us. It should warn us about the relationships and friendships we have based on a shared sin. When we join another because of our shared hatred of a third. Two people get along because they both share a joy and a lust for gossip. What do we see around us all the time these days? Angry people joining together in their sinful anger. Wicked people do not get along with their wickedness forever. We must guard our hearts during these days. So what happens to the woman? She is attacked and destroyed by the beast and the ten horns. The kings and the kingdoms of the world turn on their own partner. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 11. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? So the question we ought to ask ourselves then is, <laughs> so why would Satan attack himself? Look at verse 17 with me. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. God has put it in their hearts. The same God who gives the kings their authority for one hour has put it into their hearts to turn on one another. God rules over all things at all times without exception so, so that nothing happens in all of creation that is contrary to his will it is all according to his will that that should be the greatest of comforts today this didn't surprise god it didn't catch him by surprise, God is in control, and we must rest in that great God. Dennis Johnson writes in his commentary, If there is one thing in all the world that the rebels do not want to do, it is the purpose of God. But they are helpless to keep that sovereign purpose out of their hearts, to protect their minds from the invasion by the Lord God Almighty. In doing what they want to do, hating the prostitute and ripping her to pieces, they are doing precisely what God wants. 
And in gathering to wage their war against Messiah, they are merely assembling for their own execution. Look at the cross. Who killed Jesus? Well, that's an easy question to answer, isn't it? Judas killed Jesus because Judas betrayed him. But what about Caiaphas? Or Pilate? Or the crowds? Or the soldiers? So who killed Jesus? Listen to what Peter says at Pentecost. These are these words should crush us. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. A hymn that speaks of that so well. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Yes, Jesus was killed by Judas, Caiaphas, Pilate, the crowds, and the soldiers. And we can add our names to the list. We are responsible. But Peter also says this, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. There, there you have it again. The plan of God, the foreknowledge of God. God is in control. Satan forced to lay the seeds of his own destruction, even as he plans to crucify the Son. That is why we rejoice. God is the sovereign king of the universe. He has loved us with an everlasting love. Therefore, he will love us to the end. Jesus overcomes. And because Jesus is the overcomer, we too shall overcome. The last verse of that hymn says, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death, and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Let's pray together. Father, we do pray. Uh, as we saw last week in the power of the resurrection, we want to live there. We want to know it. We want it to transform us. Father, we pray in the face of the enemy that our eyes would only be fixed on Jesus, that our gaze would be so filled with him that nothing else would matter. And we pray it in his great name. Amen. Let's join our voices one more time in singing together in praise to our God, the doxology. Receive now the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glorious presence with exceeding great joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Blessings to you all.